Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Darren Evans. He is the creator of AfterCloud. It is a memory sharing app, collecting and sharing app. I guess I should let him explain it because I think I'm butchering it already. So thanks for joining me, Darren. Absolute pleasure, Jennifer. Good to be here. So you have a backstory, your own personal journey with dementia, and that's kind of what led you into the app. So why don't we start with your introduction and your story, and we'll go into talking about your app. Sure. Um, so I, I, I guess to put it into context, I, I've been providing health and social care solutions for about 20, well, 20 plus years, more than I can care to remember, but if you can see the color of my hair, 20 plus years um, to health and social care companies. So technology, technology solutions, CRM databases, mobile workforce management solutions, lots of different things. And um, a little over two years ago, two and a half years ago now, actually, uh, my wife and my sister-in-law were primary carers for my mother-in-law, who had a very, very aggressive form of Lewy body dementia. I, I was, at the time, I was actually providing some consultancy services for a large corporate in London. Um, so nothing to do with what I'm doing now uh in terms of app development or entrepreneurship or anything else and the 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 form of louis body dementia that she had was really really aggressive so um literally within just over six months we you know we saw the hallucinate hallucinations and sort of slight aggressive aggression and um within six months she died basically and it wasn't until after the funeral so post-funeral we were going through, you know, as you do, you're going through family possessions and whatnot. And um, we we were going through a family photo album. And my son, who was 11 at the time, uh, was questioning who who was in the photos through the family photo album. Now, my wife's father died some years ago. And now with her mum gone as well, she didn't have the answers. And it... It was only really then it dawned upon us that that rich family history is gone. It, you know, we, we we can't get that back. And um, so that, that was one of the things. And, and the other thing was that it was really the first time, uh, I think the three of us, my wife, my, my son and myself, grieved as a family unit post-death. And um, anyway, my son said to me, who he was 11 at the time, look, Dad, you, you know, you work in technology. Can't you do something that will, in essence, help other people in a similar situation. And that's really kind of, you know, that light bulb moment, I guess. Um, and so I started reaching out to people in, you know, right across health and social care that I know, that I've worked with over the years. And, and what was interesting was there's lots of clinical systems um, in place, but nothing really that, were, that was, I guess, person-centered or for the individual and their families. And, and that was that was the start of AfterCloud. That's that's really th that that was the start of it. Yeah. I'm always amazed at people that have gone through the Alzheimer's or some form of dementia journey that create something different and new. And there seems to be a lot more people interested in preserving memories for after. What I found is that um it, I, I like to call it a community and, and what you find is people have lived experience and, and you're absolutely right you know they 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 you know, we talked earlier they meant they write books or they create apps or they you know become therapists or practitioners or counselors and uh, through that lived experience so it's all really heartfelt and that's that's absolutely what I found talking to people it's um yeah, it's really interesting. One of the very first people, funny enough, I spoke to uh, in terms of the basis of the idea was uh, Robbie Rochella. She's so she's Italian, but she um, she was at the time she was head of quality of life of HC1 and HC1 in the UK uh, are one of the largest 
residential care providers. So they, you know, they look after a lot of people with dementia and Alzheimer's, and as well as you know, general older aged people with all sorts of life limiting illnesses. Um, so not hospice, but just aged care essentially. And uh, I remember because I noted it down at the time, and we'll use it on the website. But she she fell in love with the notion and the idea of the app because she lost she came from a single parent family and her mum died when she was 12 years old. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, but, and, and this is the real kind of twist, if you will, she, she was adopted by her best friend's family. So she had a lovely upbringing in that sense. But she told me when we were talking about Aftercloud, um, she had, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember the old voice, voicemail uh, cassettes. Yes. That, yeah. So she had a little mini, uh, voice cassette of her mum and she lost the tape Ooh. and 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 I remember distinctly I remember her saying it's her voice I miss the most I wish I could hear her again and I wrote it down and I said Robbie you, you, you just said this to me and that was the essence of Aftercloud so with her permission we use that as as the strap line on the website back well in the early days that's that's essentially what it what it was yeah so exactly how does the app work? Walk, walk us through the details a little bit there. It, it's an interesting, it's a really interesting question, Jennifer, because it's, it's, it's different for different people. Um, what we originally conceived the app for is actually different to what it does now, interestingly. So um, for me, when we started, and I was wrong, I have to admit I was wrong. I, it was conceived as an app for end of life. So we thought, okay, well, what can we do for people that, that are nearing end of life? And, and, and at that point, it was capturing those moments, capturing those special memories, if you will, but also giving them the opportunity to play it forward. So the app itself, and as I say, I was wrong, but I'll, I'll explain that shortly. The app itself allows people to capture what we call moments as multiple content types. So as an example, you can record audio in, in the app you can record video, you can record, um, or well, actually you can write or dictate letters, you can upload images, and all of those things combined, or multiple, multiples of those combined, to create one moment. Um, and it has speech to text throughout as well, so people can just talk to it and you know, type out what they want or write what they want. And, um, and then what they can do is they can publish it today with their friends and family. So it's very closed group. It's um, private and secure closed groups. It's, we're not social media. So they can publish it right now and share. But the real, I, I guess, benefit is that they can post to a future date. So, and, and this was the notion of end of life, you see, they could start almost like a digital memory box. They could start to post um, goodbye letters or hello letters, um, special birthday wishes anniversary wishes, uh, those sorts of little things that they could do. Um, but actually what's happened is that it's used for life enrichment and life legacy. And we have, we have um, practitioners now, therapists that provide uh, you know, art therapy, uh, dance therapy, music therapy, reminiscence, memory care, um, that capture those moments that the families themselves wouldn't be privy to. And they can share that then with those loved ones so that they can see the benefits of, of, of that therapy. So it's, and again, it's different for different people. Makes sense. Can you upload, like I have an audio recording of my paternal grandmother oh, talking wonderful. about a project that my dad was involved with in Africa. My dad wasn't a huge traveler. So him going to Africa twice was incredible, but he was part of a, a organization was helping with um it was called the international vision volunteers which was a part of the rotary international and he's not an eye doctor or anything in the medical field he was a phone engineer but he he did photography in the pr and they had to ship everything in a shipping container so the idea was you know they're putting in these large pieces of medical equipment and chairs and such but there was still space and they had to pay for the shipping container full, empty, whatever. So they decided to build a library for the villages around where they were working. And Wonderful. my 
his mom, my paternal grandmother, was the head librarian at a local school. And I knew that she helped collect books for this library. I did not realize how much she was involved in that. And before she died, I have approximately a 10 minute recording of her telling that story of, I swear, like if somebody like finished a book and put it in their bag, she'd stop the car and like, can I have that book for the Africa <laughs> library? I mean, it's just a, it's a story I'd never heard. I knew what my dad had done. And then I knew more about what she'd done. And so like, you know, like most people, I intend to put all the pieces together in a little, there's a video of their whole, the whole project, not just the library, but it's more on the surgeries they're doing for the cataracts and the dental work they're doing down there. And then there's a little bit about the library, but I'm trying to get the people who have the photographs. Absolutely. Share them with me so that I can put her voice recording with the photos that he's in and he took and make a new video. And I think that would be a perfect thing to then share with family, but also maybe post it, like share it on his birthday. Or I know they're going back, I think, for their third trip. They're going back wow. again. It's got to yeah. be more than their third trip because he went in, oh, I don't know, the early aughts. I can't remember if it was before or after 2005. But it's, you know, so I could upload that audio. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that that's a perfect example of how the app can be utilized to enrich that family history. Because then, and, and, and really, I mean, being unselfish, it's about the future generations that can look back and, and, and see that, you know, um, see the pictures, hear the, hear the audio, watch the videos. You know, we, we, we nothing really exists that enriches that kind of legacy um not in a private sense and that's that's essentially what we're doing yeah yeah that's a perfect example well i also post you know on on my social media so not not in the same kind of context we're talking about here i will post like a throwback thursday photo and sometimes i'll go back like i recently posted one of my paternal great grandmother who was holding a dog now this so we're talking if my paternal grandmother was born in 1918, this was probably prior to the 1900s, which is now that's really that's really far back. My mom's side of the family has always been dog lovers. So to see my paternal great grandmother with a dog in a photograph that's that old was really interesting. And one of my cousins follows me on Instagram. And when she saw it, her comment with the picture was, I'm not crying. It's just allergies. So it's like I realized that in in a very minor way that I touched her and maybe she hadn't seen that photo. It's her great grandmother too. So I can, I can totally see how this would work. (laughs) What what would really work well with that is, is the audio of you telling her or telling the wider family of of the narrative, but maybe, I mean, what we have at the moment is, is one guy actually, and and these are only ones that I know of because everybody's, content and their data is private we i have no we, we as a business as a company have no access to anybody's data you know we have strict things that we have to adhere to as a, as a company uh, but on the odd occasion i'll do a training session to a hospice or, or a group of nurses and in a couple of instances we've had patients so patients in receipt of palliative care in the community that have come together in one instance i had 30 or you know on a zoom and um uh, that's not an advertisement, but you know, you know what I mean. It's kind of so we did it, and um, one of the guys, uh, a chap called Nick, um, volunteered himself at the time. He said, I, "I would love to talk about the app and how how I use it." So we that was great. Really, really thankful. And what he's doing, he's actually going through his family photo album and he's taking uh, a, a digital image through the app of of the photo itself, and then creating that wider narrative audially so he's telling he wants his sons essentially to know everything about 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 the family history so that's one way he's doing it we've got another guy uh rick so i've (laughs) nick and rick um, and what he's he's and he won't mind me saying this um he's uh uh he has motor neuron disease but he still has his voice and he uses a digital pencil and he creates digital art and it's just exceptional. The artwork he creates is just phenomenal. But again, he, he uses, uh, in fact, what, he, what he's doing is he's 
every piece of artwork has a letter and the letter is so he dictates to the app and and it will type out the letter for him and he attaches the letter to the artwork again so that people understand his um I, I guess his perception his what he feels he wants to portray in his artwork everyone's slightly different aren't they that you see different things in you know in different pieces of work but this is his perspective because he's the artist um we've got other people that use it for you know grandma's secret cake recipe <laughs> just people that tell me about these things it's just incredible it's absolutely incredible yeah that's really interesting and i have hundreds of photos well probably thousands of photos hundreds of slides and my, my husband was supposed to scan them all before we moved. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to take that one over, I think. But we've lost a lot of the family history because neither my paternal, no, no, maternal grandmother or my mom were good at captioning a photo or writing on the back who it is. And so I need to scan these and get with one of my mom's brothers to see if he recognizes some of these people. And then with, my uncle's wife, so my aunt, who did a lot of family tree heritage tracing, to see if she recognizes other people. And then I guess the rest of it's just going to have to go away. Although when my, my dad died and we had all these pictures, and I'm like, I don't know who any of these people are. My husband, he, he was thinking futuristic, and I, I love him for this, but he's like, you should just scan them to the cloud because someday somebody will be able to identify them. And I said, if there's no identification now, how is the future cloud going to be able to identify these people? And maybe in 100 years they could, but i that's a lot of scanning. <laughs> well, I think the advancements of technology, anything's possible using AI, deep dive, uh, you know, looking through records because everything's now publicly available. Um, he's probably, I think you and he are probably ahead of the curve because not many people thought about putting things together uh like you've done you know throwback thursday i think it's what, a, what an idea that's brilliant i mean i love it sometimes i post pictures from like this time last year sometimes it's pictures of my mom or sometimes it would go back into my childhood but then i have to scan more photos so i have to <laughs> so i was pulling some out the other day i'm like oh this is my great grandmother with a dog that's cool because everybody knows that i've got golden retrievers because their frequent uh, contributions to my social media because they're they're much more cuter than I am. <laughs> but I talk about my how mom and grandma and probably even my great grandmother they they didn't they didn't keep good photo albums. So how would we encourage people to take up this pastime of creating these moments? Because it's a you know it's. You're, it's either a loving hobby that you do because you really want to, or you almost have to be, I don't want to say coerced, but you almost have to be convinced as to why it's a good thing to spend a little bit of time on every week. How can we convince people to spend time on it? Uh, no, that's a really good question. I think there are two things there that I would touch on. One is that um, social media itself, well, no, no, no mobiles themselves are doing it for us these days because every we're mobile first we're a mobile first as an app we're mobile first we're award-winning as well for dementia support i have to say um but but most of the content there will be on your library so it's already on your phone it's there um and interestingly uh, i'm an, uh, uh, an ios user me so, too yeah so apple have done a great thing for me and what they do is if i go out for the weekend in fact this weekend just gone we had a, my, my son is um, heritage trains, I wouldn't say fanatic, but he's, he, you know, he's a, a, what they call a TTI, a train ticket inspector on a heritage line, which is local to us. And somehow they, they've kind of drawn me in to help him and assist him. So we were both there at the weekend and it was a, a 1940s weekend. So everyone was there dressed up and, and, and this, we had the steam there. It was really nostalgic. Even Churchill, there was an actor there playing church. It was, it was just brilliant. And all the soldiers reenacting how it was in the 1940s. And um, anyway, it came to sort of Sunday evening, Monday morning. And I got this update through, through Apple. And they collated everything together for me. 
about the weekend. So all the photos that I'd taken, uh, well, that can now be uploaded into Aftercloud as a moment. So they, they're kind of doing the hard work for me now. Um, but I think, so that's, that's one thing that is, is help, helps and assists. You've got your mobile there and the content is there as well. But I also think that it creates the ability to have those meaningful conversations with your loved ones, with your grandparents, with your parents, and really start to delve in deeper about the, you know, where they come from, where their parents' parents come from, and, and really delve and have great conversations over the dinner table, maybe Thanksgiving or whatever it might be. But, you know, you can really start to utilise it in that sense. I don't think it needs much thought. It's just starting. Oh, sometimes starting is the hardest part. What do you have going on in your after cloud, if you can share? Yeah, I've started to, started to collate um, little bits of my grandparents. My brother actually started uh, ooh, probably about four or five years ago building the family tree, maybe five, six years ago actually now, but building the family tree. So we've got that uh, uh, basic data to work from. Uh, what we're trying to do now is pull in as many uh, photos as we can to build that wider narrative and the story behind it. But as I say, uh, it's allowing me now to have those conversations. In fact, this Sunday, I'm going to go and see my mum. Um, uh, uh, and no doubt we'll have conversations about uh, and take some photos and just, again, normalise it, really. It also allows us to talk about the future. And That's a wishes. good point. Um, so it kind of normalizes that conversation too yeah because once we normalize end of life desires it's really not that big a deal we were talking no. about that before we hit record and how you know death doulas are becoming more common and i i like to tell the stories like my family we're we must be slightly morbid because we have no problems talking about our end of life which is once we decided now it's just kind of a I don't want to say a joke, but we'll tease each other about, well, you still want to be shot into space. OK, yeah, you still want to be a tree. OK, great. And it's just it's just normalized. And it's, yeah. you know, I think it would almost be odd if somebody all of a sudden said, you know, I, I think I'd rather be buried with a fancy headstone and blah, blah, blah. That would be harder conversation because it'd be so different than what we're already talking about. So, so yeah, no, you're, I think you're absolutely right. It's an interesting one. We, we've built into the app um, what we call a companion. So there are essentially three roles. Uh, we've, you know, the individual, the loved one that gets invited in, and then the companion. And we've built that in specifically for people that are, are either unable or cognitively to, you know, don't have the capacity to do it for themselves. So it's a perfect tool for doulas. Uh, and end of life and legacy work. We did that specifically. And, um, you know, part of our model is to build those relationships, trusted relationships with, with doulas, with hospices, with nurses, practitioners, and, and that sort of thing. The other thing about uh, what you were talking about, the headstone there, is with moments, and that's our After Cloud Moments app right now, it, it's almost here now and play it forward. Our next iteration, our next app is called Timelines. And the, and the rationale behind that is because that, you know, you and I, we, we, you know, we both know where we're, when we were born, um, none of us, even though it's going to happen to everybody, none of us know our transition date. So what we decided uh, quite early on was as a part of our development cycle is that we create um, a timeline for everybody. So you have a birth date, you have all of these pivotal moments throughout your life, which you can add to. And then what we do is we create a public page for you together with a, a, a code. And then that code is made available together with a eulogy or a public statement upon death. So it's kind of like a living will, not official living will, but I was talking to someone today actually about something to accompany your will um, in the form of, you know, explanation or, or video, whatever it might be. Um, and then future generations can also look back because we can make that code available on memorials, on um, special places uh, that, that they can read and look back on. So that, again, it sort of brings that person alive. Yeah. Do you ever think it'll be an AI person that'll be able to replay, like you can ask it, 
what what happened on, like tell me about your wedding day and it'll be able to bring all those memories up those wow. moments <laughs> you know that's fascinating isn't it because i think the power and speed of technology and technological change there's no reason why we wouldn't be able to do that in the future yeah you have to remember i'm not very far from silicon valley and my husband grew up about a mile and a half from where apple headquarters is so you said you're an ios guy so i've been to the apple headquarters pre and post spaceship so <laughs> it's just Amazing. kind of a norm it's a neat building I, when when we started developing um so uh, slightly off piece but i, I i'm a, a local volunteer of a befriending service here in our local community and we deliver meals um mostly to older people but during covid and we were pre-covid as a concept but during covid we we were um sending meals around to people that had to self-isolate and, and shelter and, and whatever and one of the guys chris uh, i'm i'm attending his funeral next thursday mm. genuinely and he was one of apple's very first uh, developers british but way goes way back and he's still got his well still had his his uh, original apple email address which apparently are quite rare um, i believe it yeah and uh, so it's one of the very very early ones and, and he 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 was uh, one of our patient advocates for a long time um and helped me you know in terms of our future direction and our path um but he he passed uh, two weeks ago yeah yeah that's unfortunate but it's that sounds like a very interesting relationship and we have a similar service for seniors older adults called meals on wheels well it's well yes yeah, for older adults and also um poor financially yeah. challenged that's the word i was looking for yeah older yeah. adults yeah my husband actually delivered for them throughout the pandemic for a year and a half oh, wonderful. And he also picked up a side delivery for a gal that is battling cancer, an older woman. And obviously during the shelter in place, she hadn't been to a grocery store like over, over a year, mm. but it was becoming, you know, it was like, he got, it was, it was like a full-time job that had no ending, you know, like a permanent job, not full-time. And she preferred a different grocery store than he shops at. For us and he finally said somebody else has to take this over because what once we started house hunting he he wanted to kind of disconnect from this community so we could focus on where we're going that, that, that makes that makes perfect sense and also it is challenging it's a lot of hard work you know we we're very very fortunate in my community that there are lots of volunteers um so we you know it's not a daily it's sort of what can you do this week and we do one or two days possibly um so yeah and we're very very fortunate that we have that you know community spirit um we also we also give gift boxes actually so people will donate locally we've got some great um shops that donate as well um with food banks uh, is an example as well that we, we've got so um yeah yeah um very very supportive we have similar our rotary club partners with what's called the village resource center here in town. And I think we give food Chris. Let's see. We give an entire Christmas dinner and gifts for all the children in a family to almost 600 families a year. Yeah. We do, a, we do a lot like that. You know, if you're familiar with rotary, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing Rotarians do. It's a service organization. So we do things in our own community, but we also do things worldwide. And it's, it's I, really. I am, yeah, I am familiar with another fraternity uh, similar. So I, I, I kind of understand what it is they do. And that's fantastic. I think it's heartfelt as well, isn't it? It's, you know, it's mm -hmm. something that benefits somebody else, which is great. Which is kind of like your app. It's like, it's just fascinating how technology is. I think it right now we have technologies kind of dividing people, but I think I've seen a lot of examples of how it could bring us together in the future or at least provide us with more of our own personal history knowledge going forward i hope we've got um a number of here in the uk a number of nhs trusts and national health we have a national health service a bit like medicare equivalent if you will but 
ours is a national health service still currently anyway and um we've we've got a number of trusts that have intimated what they would like to see potentially is the app um uh, prescribed if you will socially prescribed uh to people that are diagnosed with a life-limiting illness so they can start to journal um you, you know their journey really uh you know for storytelling journaling sharing I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be family and friends it can be other stakeholders as well you see you can, whoever you invite in is in that in that closed group and it's private um so so yeah it's um it's an interesting time because there is a there's a health focus as well as a kind of uh, a personal one yeah and yeah, that's it's i i feel kind of blessed having been born at the end of 1966 that I did not grow up with technology, but I acquired it in my teenage years. And I, you know, I keep telling people I'm going to be around at least another 45 years. So I'm just really fascinated to see where we end up at the end we, of my you, life. You and I are a similar age, and I, I hope to join that club with you. <laughs> I'm working on it. You never know. It's like I, I tell people, unless I get hit by a bus riding my bike, then I plan on being around for at least 45 more years, as long as I still have my brain. Cause if I don't have my brain, then we can just, we can just pull the plug because that's not fun. I've lived through that twice. <laughs> I think, I think with advancements in science, technology uh, and health related science as well, I wouldn't, would be at all surprised if there are certain breakthroughs that we'll see, we'll see in our lifetime that will potentially assist and help people with any, with any cognitive declined diagnosis or, or, or uh, illness. Uh, so, you know, people living with dementia can live quite a full life these days, you know, and um, I think with life enrichment activities, uh, reminiscence, you know, because the other thing about reminiscence is it brings back other memories. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've got, uh, we've got, I, should, I, I didn't mention this, but we've got a couple of research um, studies at the moment with, um, a major university here in the UK, St Andrews in Scotland, it, quite esteemed, well known. And um, we're working with Alzheimer's Scotland and the Dementia Arts Trust in how people that use uh, uh, their physical skills to create art can share that with their family and loved ones that otherwise wouldn't be, again, because people are dispersed nowadays, um, which, so they can share that art within app. But it, what, what it's proving to do is again bring back further reminiscence so it's aiding that and again i think with with ai there's no reason why we couldn't look at uh, cognitive decline through voice and retrace the data to help and assist in that process as well so there's lots there's lots we can do to assist in that respect so in the next 50 years there's going to be a lot of a lot of interesting changes technology medical there's going to be a convergence. We've seen almost a digital revolution, haven't we, during COVID? I think the other point as well is it's made everyone implicitly aware of their own mortality because, you know, everyone kind of, whoa, you know, death is inevitable, but it's also possible and feasible. Um, so it's kind of made everyone aware as well. So it's, it's it, I hate to say it, but it's actually, in some respects, normalised the conversation around it. Thankfully, there were a few positives that came out of all of this insanity we yeah. lived through you know like yeah. telehealth uh, doctor's appointments i've done a couple of those love that not always as effective as in person but no you know um there, when you get the right when you can communicate what's going on very clearly it, it can be very beneficial and i've talked to a gal about the pros and the cons of of a telehealth appointment versus an in-person visit and there's Definitely benefits to both. So doing both is probably in our best interest. And I know here in the States that telehealth was not really an option until 2020. No, no, <laughs> absolutely. But you know, well, that, again, because of COVID, um, we've managed to have, and I say we, this is a very small team, but we've managed to have, you know, really open, honest, meaningful conversations around the globe. And we wouldn't have, well, I mean, we wouldn't even dreamt of having those conversations before COVID. Um, it, you know, it wasn't really even conceivable that we'd have those conversations, but here we are, you know. 
uh, it's brought the world closer together for sure. Um, and I think that is another blessing. So we, we, as I say, we've gone through that kind of digital revolution, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I laugh because my husband is originally from New York and I keep telling people I really should move to the East coast of the States because I speak to enough people like yourself in the UK and being in California, there's an eight hour difference, which yeah. makes it very challenging because it's bedtime for you. And it's just after lunch for me. And I think it'd be so much easier if I was on the West, East coast versus the West coast, but we seem to still make it work. We do, and, do you know, it's saying that I, right in the beginning of COVID, I was having um, very, very early morning conversations in New Zealand and Australia and very, very late conversations in the evening in the States and Canada and everything else in between. And I kind of, you know, <laughs> soon down. So I just do the occasional one now and plot them and just, you know, make sure that my diary isn't too back to back. But uh, but no, we're looking forward to We're looking forward. I mean, the, the app is is live it's available now for everyone to download it's free um unless you want to play it forward in which case you can buy you know a year three years five years that's entirely up to the individual but it is free to download and utilize so we just encourage everyone to have an account yeah well i think i'm going to check it out more since now i know i can upload stuff i've already got like the conversation with my my nano so she was called and then my daughter is planning a wedding and so I can upload my own wedding pictures because they weren't digital back in 1989 and talk about memories from that day and then attach them to the planning and the memories of her day. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the thing is, as soon as you do that, you know, you're safe in the knowledge it's in the cloud. Um, and, and that's the beauty of it. You know, it's after cloud. It's there. Um, and it's there for generations, hopefully, to come. Absolutely. Now, how do we let them know? We just tell them that it's there. How do, so, we, how do we let the future yeah. generations know? Ah, well, that, that's the thing. So we, we create that persona, that public profile on a web page uh, together with the code, which you, you it's your code, effectively. It's individual. It's for everybody. Um, you can share that. We can also place it on memorials in due course in those next 45, 50 years, wherever it may be. Um, 2066 <laughs> yeah yeah that'd be nice for me for me for me as well um but it, but it, you know if, if everyone if you wanted to download it today as an example and then share it it's, it's aftercloud.co.uk or on the app store aftercloud and you'll find it yeah i looked it up earlier before we started recording just so i could remind myself of what we were not what we were talking about but so i didn't get confused with anything else because that happens and it's you know, and I've talked to other people with other similar apps, but so far this one's the most interesting to me. So, oh, thank you. That's very important. Apologies to the previous people, but everybody has their own spin. And this one appeals to me possibly because I am very half entrepreneur and half artist. So it, I think it's connecting to me better because of that. I hope that makes sense. It does. I think the, the thing that I think separates us. Because I, I was asked this you know, a couple of weeks ago, in, and I think the fact that we have multiple content types all combined, you know, you can have as many as you like, all combined to create a moment. So it's not just one thing, like with social media today. And, and also it's not social media. And that's the other thing that people dislike. You know, a, I, won't, I won't mention any names, but a large platform um, where a memory will pop up. Mm. And... You know, you've not, you may not have asked for that memory to pop up and it can be quite triggering for people. Uh, well, we tell people that they've got a moment. So we send a notification to individuals that they have a moment sent by and it's up to them, you know, if they open that moment. Similarly, if you post a moment to the future, it can't be opened until that specific date. So... Uh, and as I say, people are forewarned as well. So it's not triggering in that sense. And we, we think it will help. It's got to be proven, of course, in that sense. But we feel it will help with grief and bereavement as well. I can see that. Because after my mom died, you know, you think back into the, to our childhood. I, ha I mentioned I have a sister. I'm not sure how the hell we're related. Because we agree on nothing. 
We, we are not similar in any respect other than same parents, both female. And that's about it. I mean, like, and we like dogs. That's about <laughs> seriously. That's about it. And for the longest time, every time I think back to a specific event of our childhood, there was always that conflict and how our parents dealt with the conflict. And it was like, why are all the memories negative? Like, what is wrong with me? I'm like this terrible negative person. And the happier ones are coming. They're starting to filter back out, thankfully, because I was beginning to really question my my memory. <laughs> not not as in that it was faulty, but like, why was it only remembering the negative stuff? So I, I agree. I think it could help. And just, you know, like I said, doing the stuff with my wedding and my daughter's wedding, I think that's a really cool tie in together. I, I don't think you're unique, actually, in that sense. I think a lot of us will remember the, you know, the times you were told off as a child or the, you know, the, the bad things that happened as a child and all the good things tend to get forgotten. Um, not always, not strictly always, but I think a lot of people do that. Yeah. yeah. It must be because the negative emotion is stronger. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I talked to enough people about Alzheimer's and caregiving and brains. And so I think that's what it is. Mm. But, you know, fortunately, some of the more positive stuff starting to filter back out. So that's a good thing. That is a very good thing. But no, I'm going to go download this and I'm either going to start with the wedding stuff or the house stuff. <laughs> Let's see which yeah, one. Please do. And, uh, and as I say, we, 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 we're we working with trusted partners. So, you know, if any of your listeners um, feel that they provide that legacy work, that supportive mechanism for other people, then we'd love to talk to them in that regard um, as a trusted partner, potentially. Um, but yeah, but, but for, for the individual, it's there, it's available and they can download it. And I'd love them to. Wonderful. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. And I appreciate you taking this late evening time with me afternoon for, for us here in the West Coast of the States. It's an absolute pleasure, Jennifer. Thank you very much for, for, you know, for having me on your podcast. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.